Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Olympus educator and wedding and portrait photographer, Joe Ellis. And today I want to talk about your Olympus viewfinder and how we can best use it to get optimal exposures from our cameras. Let's get into it. Okay. So first up here, uh, the real basis of this whole thing is that one of the main advantages to having a mirrorless camera, to having an Olympus camera, is that you can use it to give you an exposure preview so that you can actually see the brightness of your photograph before you take it. And I think that that's a really essential tool that we have in our mirrorless cameras, but it does require a little bit of study and a little bit of understanding on how to kind of get the best use out of it. The first thing that I want to mention is that the exposure uh, preview only works plus three stops of brightness and minus three stops of brightness. Once you get beyond three stops overexposed or three stops underexposed, then the exposure preview ceases to make any changes to the picture. And just to illustrate that, I've got a little inception going on here. I've got my camera pointed at a photograph, so I'm taking a picture of a picture, and then I'm broadcasting that into my laptop and then getting a live screen feed of that. So I can show you what's going on. So let's just go here and you'll see this photograph. If I go ahead and overexpose this picture. If we get to three stops and then we keep going, you can see that there's no change to the brightness of the picture. And the exact same thing happens if you go to minus three stops. Okay, so only within that three stop range are you seeing the uh, exposure preview. The other really important thing about exposure preview is that it is not showing you the aperture at which you're working. It's really important to know that exposure preview is really just changing the brightness of the photograph to give you a simulation of the exposure that you've chosen. If you want to see the actual aperture and the depth of field for your actual photograph before you take it, you would use the depth of field preview button. And you can assign that to your and cameras, one of your camera's um, custom buttons. If you have an EM1 Mark II, for example, you can, you can go ahead and program it to be one of the buttons on the front of the camera. And of course, you would do that in the button function menu inside the gear icon. Um, and that gives you the ability to go ahead and touch that button, have the lens closed down, and then you can actually see the uh, aperture and depth of field that you've chosen. It's really important to note that when you're using depth of field preview and you're getting an a, uh, exposure preview uh, simulation, you are a little bit limited there. You cannot get exposure preview using your depth of field button if you use a shutter speed longer than one quarter of a second or if you use an aperture that's greater than f8. So it has to work within that bounds I've found. If I go to half a second or a full second, or if I go to f10 or f11, then I can't get an exposure preview using my depth of field preview button. In that case, you just wanna go ahead and take a photograph and then review it and then decide where you wanna go from there. But just a little bit of limitation there. But it's really important to note that you're not looking at your actual exposure when you're getting the exposure preview. You're looking at a brightness change in the viewfinder to kind of give you a simulation of that exposure change. Okay, um, a side note I just want to make, this is a little bit geeky, but it is important to note that there are different types of viewfinders in our Olympus cameras. In the EM1 Mark II and the EM1X, you're looking at a uh, 120 frames per second LCD or LED, one of those <laughs> LCD or LED style viewfinder. And the critical thing with 120 frames per second is that because it has a faster refresh rate, it's redrawing the photograph at 120 frames per second rather than 60 or 30, for example, is that it shows motion smoother. So if you are panning fast or dealing with something that's moving really quickly, you're getting a smoother rendition of it through the viewfinder. With the EM5 Mark III and the EM10 Mark III, for example, um, those use a different style of viewfinder. It's an OLED viewfinder. And the advantage that those have is that the colors are richer, the blacks are deeper, and it's a little bit more um, satisfying in terms of looking through the viewfinder for a lot of people. But those viewfinders refresh at 60 frames per second, so they're not drawing the picture quite as often, and so uh, they wouldn't be quite as good as the EM1X or EM1 Mark II during those peak action uh, moments. Uh, it's pluses and minus on both sides of the fence because on the EM1X and the EM1 Mark II, you're not getting quite as deep of a black or as um, punchy or vibrant of color as you would through an EM10 Mark III, for example. So just a word to the wise. Okay, so uh, now to the heart of the matter. Um, when you look at, through your camera or on the back of the camera on the screen, you're going to be able to look at a lot of information that's going to help you make a better exposure. 
And I think it's really important to take a minute to set this up and understand kind of the ins and outs of how to get this to work the way you want. So the first thing is that you can set up pages of information that you can look at by cycling through using the info button. So as you tap the info button on the back of the camera, you can see varying pages of different things that you want to evaluate. For me, I have two pages set up in mine. One is image only, and that means that there's no overlay on the photograph and I'm seeing just the picture. The other one is for me, all of the information. So I just have the two states, um, and it actually winds up being three because there's sort of a default state that the camera has But if you do not touch the info button. So just to show you kind of how that looks, let's cycle through on my camera and kind of show you the three pages that I have. So first up here, let's look at the default screen. When you first power the camera on and you're looking through it or looking at the screen on the back, it's gonna show this information, which includes your shutter speed, aperture, so on and so forth, ISO on the back of the screen. If you cycle the info button once, you'll get to my second page of information, or my first defined page of information, which is nothing at all. So that's a blank screen. It's just showing just the image with no overlays of information. And if I hit it one more time, then I am seeing all of my information. I'm seeing all the information that I set up, which includes my histogram, it includes my shadow and highlight warnings, and it includes my level. So how do I set that up? If you go into the D menu, uh, specifically D1, you'll go to Info Settings. In Info Settings, there's a few things to go through here. Uh, the first one is that you can set up what you see in playback, and then you can see what you see in Live View. So if I go to Live View Info, you can see that I have two pages of information set up. Each one of these things is a different press of the Info button. So the first one is image only, and the second one is my custom settings for what I want to see on that screen. So if I go to custom one, you can see that I have checked my histogram, my highlight and shadow warning, and my level gauge. So that's how I have mine set up, and you can set yours up the way that you see fit. So if I back out here and I go to playback info, you can see that cycling through, I can see the image only, I can see um, the histogram, I can see highlight and shadow, and so on and so forth and you can go through and check the boxes here. I won't go into a lot of that today, but this is where you set up what you're actually capable of seeing. All right, and let's go back out. So the first thing I wanna talk about is highlight and shadow. So highlight and shadow is actually a warning system that allows you to see when any part of your picture is approaching pure white and when any part of your picture is approaching pure black. And it's kind of based on the histogram. Um, the histogram, if we look at it real quick, uh, let me just go to playback so we can look at a bigger one. So on the histogram here, on the left hand side is a value of zero. It's a brightness value of zero. And on the right hand side is a brightness value of 255. Now in point of fact, you have red, green, and blue pixels in your camera. And any one of those pixels uh, can be any one of those colors, red, green, or blue, and they can be any one of a brightness from zero to 255. What this one is, is actually an amalgamation of all of the pixels that are in it. So it's taking all red, green, and blue pixels and saying, what are your brightness values? The height of the histogram is how many pixels are at that brightness value. So like uh, medium gray, exactly middle gray, would be the middle of the histogram, and it would be how many pixels, red, green, or blue, that have that middle brightness value, if that makes sense. If you were shooting a photograph of a perfectly lit gray wall, then you would see a single spike in the middle of your histogram that was 20 million pixels high because every pixel that is at uh, in that picture would be at medium, would be the same brightness value, that gray value, and they would all be stacked on top of each other. So what's important here is that uh, on the left-hand side of the histogram is pure black and on the right is pure white. So that's zero and 255. Those are That's all the brightness values that any pixel can have. They can have 250 five or 56 brightness values. So you can define when you wanna see a warning on the screen when a pixel approaches pure black or when it approaches pure white. So if I go back to live view for a second, as I start to overexpose this picture, as I see these little red warnings on the screen, that means that there are some pixels that are in those areas that are approaching that pure white. If you are shooting a photograph and it includes the sun, you will not be able to get rid of this red warning, right? Because we can't you know, bring the exposure down far enough for the sun to come in to register when it's high in the sky anyway. So um, if you are okay with pixels in those areas being pure white or getting close to pure white, then that's great. 
But if you want if, if you want the camera to warn you and say, oh, you know what, you're overexposed to that sweater or shirt or something like that, and you want to know that ahead of time, you can use this warning system to help you know that and make exposure changes before you actually shoot the photograph. The same thing happens on the underside. So as I go to uh, down, you can see that, if I can get it far enough down here, you can see that um, you get these blue these blue warnings, and those are pixels that are approaching pure black. Same about thing, same both ways. Now, you can actually define when that warning system starts to kick in. And so, if you go to histogram settings in your camera, by going, I think it's in D three histogram settings, you can define when highlight and shadow begin to show that warning. So, if you were to say take the highlights down to two hundred and fifty and the shadows up to five, you are going to see warnings come on more earlier in the process of overexposure and underexposure so that you can uh, understand if you need to make those, quick, those corrections more quickly. Now, pro tip, if you shoot raw files with your Olympus camera, uh, there is a, more information than you're seeing in the histogram. A histogram is being generated by the JPEG that the camera would make. And JPEGs don't have as much latitude as raw files do. If you shoot a RAW file with an Olympus camera and you have some pixels that have gone beyond the end of the histogram or something like that, you can recover about a stop, sometimes a stop and a third information, out beyond the edge of the histogram. And that means that you can recover highlights that are, are actually would be showing you as blown out in the photograph. And so um, if you, like me, like to overexpose your photographs a little bit and then bring them back in post, just know that if you don't set up your warnings um, you know, to be uh, conservative, you're still going to be fine. As long as you don't have a ton of information that's gone beyond that limit, you're going to be able to recover it for the most part. It's important to test that for yourself, but I find that if I overexpose a little bit, if I have a little bit of things that have gone beyond the end of my histogram, that's actually optimal for me because I can bring them back in, in my raw processing and now I've got an optimal exposure and the optimal amount of data and the lowest possible noise. Okay. Uh, the next thing is probably my biggest trick that I've got for you today, and that is that when you are looking through the viewfinder, one of the things that I find a little bit difficult in low light conditions for especially, is that I have a hard time seeing where my autofocus point is set. I oftentimes will want to, you know, like go and move it just to know exactly where I put it. But did you know that you can actually turn on a, um, a grid in your camera, and that grid can change color? And when you change the color of the grid, you change the color of your autofocus point in its resting state, not in its active state. So this is pretty cool. If you go into grid settings and you go to display color and we go to preset one, then you can see that preset one is got uh, the grid showing as uh, gray. Uh, red, green, and blue pixels for the grid are all the same. That makes gray and it's at 100% brightness. So if I kind of click out here, we should be able to, oops, I need to go select it. Let me go make sure I preset one, select. You can see I have a gray uh, grid. Well, the viewfinder is also, the little autofocus point is actually also gray, but if I were in a dim condition, that little autofocus box can sometimes get lost. But if I go and change the color of the grid in grid settings, like we'll say preset two, which is red. I said I, said I want the red to be uh, the only color and we've changed it to 75% brightness, but you know, we could go all the way up to 100. Now, when I go and select that, you can see that my grid is red, but my autofocus point in its resting state is also red. And so if you are shooting in low light conditions, this might be a real win for you. I've been turning this on when I've been working at night and it's actually been quite nice just to be able to have that easy reference to be able to see that autofocus point that much easier. Okay, in the wrench icon of your camera, I think this is true of all Olympus cameras, if we go down to the wrench, uh, you can go over and because I have this plugged in through HDMI, I can't change it, but this third option here is the screen settings. In the wrench icon in the screen settings, you can change the color balance of your, um, of your screen and also its brightness. And so if you uh, think that your screen is a little bit too bright and it's causing you to underexpose your photographs because it's artificially boosting the brightness of your picture, you could go in there, for example, and have it say, I want this to be a little bit dimmer because I don't want to be fooled by the fact that my, my screen is quite bright. 
And um, I've definitely successfully done that in other uh, cameras and had good success in kind of having it help me make sure that I'm not underexposing. And I, you know, if I, ha if I have to say this a hundred times, <laughs> I will, but um, just in general, it's good for your Olympus camera, for any digital camera really, to be slightly overexposed rather than slightly underexposed if you want to collect the optimal data. I know that some of the uh, you know, full frame cameras and things are so great at retaining data that you can underexpose with no penalty. Um, but in our cameras, especially when we're shooting at high ISO for example, a little bit of overexposure helps a lot in the processing of the photograph to give you optimal data, optimal image quality in the end in terms of noise performance. So I tend to overexpose my high ISO pictures by a third, a half, or maybe even two, two thirds of a stop whenever possible. Okay, um, one other little trick I just want to mention is that if you are shooting and you have something like auto ISO enabled, I'll go here and just enable auto ISO for example, for a second. If your camera cannot use the, if you specify the range of your auto ISO to be something like, you know, 100 to 1600, and the camera cannot achieve a good exposure within that auto ISO range, you will get a blinking auto ISO. So I'm just gonna go ahead and change this up to F16 and I'm gonna make the shutter speed quick. And you can see that auto ISO is saying, it's blinking at you saying, I can't get you a good exposure given your uh, current settings. Anytime anything in the viewfinder is blinking at you, it's really important that you pay attention to it. So just a word to the wise. Okay, so a few closing thoughts here. Uh, the metering in the camera, while very sophisticated, uh, is frequently not the optimal thing that I'm looking for. I'll give you guys an a, example that I run into all the time as a wedding and portrait photographer. A lot of the interiors of the churches I work in are either very dark or very bright. If I'm in a church that's all whitewashed and beautiful and has all these gorgeous windows and everything in front of me is very bright white and I have a white dress and all that kind of good stuff, if I shoot a picture in that scenario using the meter, it's, it's going to underexpose the photograph. And the reason is that the meter does not understand that everything that's in front of it is bright and white and that it should be rendered that way. So it's important to look at all the information that's coming into you and make sure that it matches with what you have, what you know in terms of experience as to how it should be metering. So I tend to make sure, like I said, if I'm in those scenarios in a white church that I'm seeing a ton of my data uh, pushed to the right hand side of my histogram, because in point of fact, everything I'm looking at is bright. And the same thing can happen if I'm in a very dark scenario. I might have a ton of information down here in the low end and have just a little spike for that white dress over here on the right. And that happens to me quite frequently as well. So um, just make sure that you're not just using the brightness of your screen to judge your exposure. And make sure that you're paying attention not only to your meter and your histogram and your highlight and shadow warnings, that you're taking an amalgamation of all that information to give yourself the optimal exposure. Okay, um, the second thing I'm gonna say, I think I already mentioned this once, but I'll say it one more time. The amount of information in the actual image file that you've captured in a RAW file far exceeds what's capable of showing in your viewfinder or on your screen. There is more dynamic range, there is more nuance, there's um, just a lot more um, detail in terms of color than you can get through your viewfinder or your screen. Your viewfinder and your screen are reference images. They're just there to aid you in the collection of your image and they don't represent all of the data that you'll have in the final. So um, just know that whether you are pushing things a little bit beyond the end of your histogram, or you're thinking things look a little bit flat, or there's not a lot of gradation in your photograph, that when you get it back in the computer, you're capable of pulling out a lot more detail than you are simply looking through the camera. And my third piece of advice, um, just as a caveat here, is that you must remember that when you put your Olympus camera into movie mode, that every button, every preset, everything you've set up in terms of stills is set aside and all of your um, settings for movies take over. So if you've not gone into your movie mode and set up all of these different things for in terms of viewfinder information and metering and, and all that kind of good stuff, all of that is separate from your stills things. And it's really important that it is that way because the way we meter and deal with movies is definitely different than it is with stills. But that can be very confusing the first time you go over there and you wonder, well, why is this changed? Why is my histogram not this way? Why is it not showing my over and under exposure warnings, which aren't available in video mode? Um, it's important to know that um, you know movie mode is a completely separate beast from your stills modes. So that's what I've got today, guys, in terms of viewfinder information. Let me know what questions you have in the comments, and we'll hook up there. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.